Hey guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. My name is April and I have been a nursing professor for more than 10 years. Today's video is another in our Nutrition for Nurses series, and we are going to talk specifically about cardiovascular disorders. So we are going to learn about ways that we can teach clients to prevent cardiovascular disorders, but also some dietary strategies that help to treat, or at least dietarily treat, some of our cardiovascular diseases. So coronary artery disease is the leading cause of death in the United States, and our biggest contributors to coronary artery disease are hypertension and atherosclerosis. So after Atherosclerosis, of course, is this cholesterol blocked artery that you see in the picture. So hyperlipidemia is just too many lipids. Those are fats in our bloodstream. So that's too much cholesterol and too many triglycerides. However, hypercholesterolemia, just to understand the difference between the two words, is a type of hyperlipidemia. And that's where we just have too much HDL cholesterol in our blood. So really important as part of this discussion that you can recognize normal values and educate clients clients about what normal values look like for a cholesterol panel. So our total cholesterol really should be less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Our LDL, which is our bad cholesterol, needs to be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Our HDL, which is our good cholesterol, we want that to be greater than 60 milligrams per deciliter. And our triglycerides need to be less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. There are lots of risk factors for coronary artery disease, some that are modifiable and some that are non-modifiable. Let's start with the non-modifiable. Of course, an age greater than 65 years, being of male gender, of course, a significant strong family history of coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disorders. And there are also some ethnicities that have a higher predisposition to cardiovascular disease. Now there are lots of modifiable things and these are really what we wanna be focusing on for our client. We can modify cholesterol, so we can bring down our high LDL, we can elevate our low LDL, or we can eat a diet low in saturated fat. We can control our hypertension, our blood sugar for diabetes, metabolic syndrome we're gonna talk about on the next slide, but controlling the factors that contribute to metabolic syndrome, uh, managing our weight, making sure we're getting regular exercise, and then smoking cessation. All of those are modifiable or risk factors that will significantly reduce cardiovascular risk. So metabolic syndrome is a cluster of factors that increases the risk, not only for cardiovascular complications, but also for diabetes mellitus type two. So a client is diagnosed with metabolic syndrome if they have at least three of the five factors that are listed on this slide. So let's go through the five factors that contribute to metabolic syndrome. The first is a fasting blood glucose greater than 100. So by fasting, we mean that nothing has been eaten for the eight hours previous to the blood test, and we want that glucose level to be less than 100. Central obesity is defined as an increased waist circumference in males greater than 40 inches and in females greater than 35 inches. We want our triglycerides to be low. So of course, triglycerides that are higher than 100 50 milligrams per deciliter contributes to metabolic syndrome. Hypertension. So anything greater than 130 over 85 is what's considered pre-hypertension. And that is a factor for metabolic syndrome. And then of course, having a low HDL, so less than 40 in males, less than 50 in females, again, does contribute to this syndrome. If your client has any three of the five of these factors, they do get a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. Okay, let's talk specific about dietary prevention of cardiovascular disease. So we want to limit those trans fat. And it's really important that our clients understand how to read nutrition labels because we really want to be eating foods that have no trans fat in them. We want to eat foods that are low in saturated fat. So less than 7% per day, less than 10% is acceptable, but really less than 7% is ideal. And one of the best ways to do that is to decrease red meat consumption. We want to be eating low cholesterol foods. So we want less than 200 milligrams per day of cholesterol. Now, conservative use of red wine is protective against uh, cardiovascular disease. So having your clients drink just one glass of red wine daily or several times a week is considered protective. We want to have clients increase their fiber intake. Remember fiber falls into the complex carbohydrates family.
daily. So increasing your fiber intake is protective. Increasing omega-3 fatty acids is also protective. And then we want to make sure that we're getting adequate amounts of folate in the diet, also vitamins B6 and B12. Now, of course, for lifestyle, regular exercise, managing weight, of course, these dietary factors will help to manage weight. And then, of course, smoking cessation are going to be the lifestyle factors that will significantly reduce cardiovascular risk. Let's talk a little more about omega-3 fatty acids. These are known as essential fatty acids, and there is a strong relationship between these essential fatty acids and a healthy heart. So essential fatty acids are necessary for making prostaglandins. Well, prostaglandins in our body do some really important things. They regulate our blood pressure, so they're going to help to lower that hypertension. They're going to ensure blood clotting is normal, and that's often important for clients with a cardiovascular risk. They also um, assist with gastric acid secretion, muscle secretions. Remember the heart is a muscle. So the better it functions, the healthier we are. And then it also controls our inflammatory response. So really important relationship between those EFAs, essential fatty acids and our heart. Omega-3s in particular are also called linolenic acid. And those work to maintain our physiologic health by lowering our risk of heart disease, by reducing not only our blood pressure, Pressure, but also that blood clotting process. So those are really important factors that contribute to cardiovascular health. Let's talk specifically about some strategies for three common cardiovascular diseases. So often clients start out with hypertension, then they end up unfortunately with a myocardial infarction, and that could possibly be complicated and progress to heart failure. So let's start with hypertension. So a sodium intake less than 2,300 milligrams per day is ideal, but, or I'm sorry, is recommended. But if we can get less than 1,500 milligrams per day, that's really the ideal goal. We want to eat low fat dairy products. We need to keep that, that fat in that lower uh, percentage. So less than uh, 10, but ideally 7% per day, but dairy promotes calcium intake and in, uh, adequate calcium intake is important for heart health. So eating those low fat dairy products does help with hypertension in particular. Fruits and vegetables, really important. They contain potassium. Potassium is important that we have a normal potassium level that will help to maintain normal blood pressure. And then of course we do want to be limiting alcohol intake. Um, after a myocardial infarction, then we're going to see clients be on a liquid diet for about 24 hours. Um, that's just to rest the body. And then we will start to progress that diet as tolerated. So much like you would see maybe in a post-surgical client, right? They would start with clear liquids for about 24 hours, and then they would progress that diet as tolerated over the next day. We really want clients post myocardial infarction to avoid caffeine. Caffeine does stimulate the heart. It also elevates our blood pressure, and we don't want any of that post myocardial infarction. Small and frequent meals are easier to digest. And then of course, we're going to be teaching at discharge all of those heart healthy uh, dietary considerations that we've just talked about in order to reduce the risk of a future myocardial infarction. And then of course, if your client were to progress into heart failure, we once again want to be limiting sodium intake. This time the recommendation is going to be around 2000 milligrams per day. So we can start out with 3000 milligrams per day, but as that heart failure worsens, that sodium intake is going to need to decline. Monitor fluid intake. So Patients with heart failure are prone to fluid volume overload, and so they might even need fluid volume restriction. So as they start to accumulate or retain fluid, we might need to be restricting fluid, um, sometimes around 1,500 to 2,000 milliliters per day in a fluid restriction. We do want increased protein, protein intake in heart failure. So a normal protein intake for just an adult that doesn't have a cardiovascular problem would be about 0 0.8 grams per kilogram, but in heart failure, we do want to increase that to be somewhere around 1.1 grams per kilogram, and that would be daily. And then of course, continuing those small frequent meals that are soft and easy to chew because that way we are conserving energy. Okay. So biggest test questions that you typically see on nutrition, how do I pick out foods that are high in these uh, recommended nutrients. Let's start with B vitamins. So our B vitamins, um, particularly B12, are going to be found in animal products. So anything that comes from an animal is going to have B12 in it. So fish, poultry, eggs, milk, 
really great sources of our B vitamins. Folic acid, green leafy vegetables, beans, peas, seeds. And in this country, um, which is the United States, if you're not watching from the United States, um, almost all of our cereals and breads are fortified with folic acid. So if you're just looking at your food labels and you see this is a fortified bread or a fortified cereal, it's going to have folic acid in it. Now remember folic acid is the supplement form of folate. So folate is going to be found in our green leafy vegetables, our beans, our peas, but folic acid is what's going to be fortified in our cereals and breads. Omega-3, so that's going to be fish, soybeans, canola oil, and walnuts, really good sources of omega-3. What we like to recommend is clients eat fish servings about three times a week in order to get sufficient omega-3. Now there are also omega-3 supplements out there as there are B supplements and folic acid supplements. However, we do know that getting nutrients in our food um, is better absorbed by our body than getting it through a supplement. So it's always better to eat the nutrients that we need rather than take a supplement. However, if we can't get enough in our diet, then supplements are certainly warranted. Fiber, so we want our clients eating foods that are higher in fiber. So oats, barley, beans, fruits and vegetables that have the skins on them, and then whole grains. Remember that anything that is white, so white rice, white pasta, or anything that on your food label says refined, it's a refined grain. Those are not going to be high in fiber. Whole grains have not gone through the refinement process. They are brown, typically brown in color, and they do contain high fiber. And then of course, high potassium. So apricots, bananas, tomatoes, potatoes, all foods that are great sources of potassium. Now keep in mind that sometimes your clients with cardiovascular risk are trying to lower their potassium. Maybe they're taking um, a medication such as a potassium sparing diuretic. So therefore they want to eat foods that are lower in potassium. Although we do want foods that are higher in potassium to maintain cardiovascular health, you really have to watch potassium levels when you have a client that has a cardiovascular disorder. So you may need high potassium, but you may need low potassium. So just keep that in mind. We also really want to be avoiding those high sodium foods. So remember anything that's processed or packaged is going to have a lot of sodium in it. And that's because that's a preservative. So your canned soups and sauces, anything you open out of a can, anything that's uh, packaged, a convenience food, so potato chips, anything that you open a package, like from the convenience store, all those foods are going to be high in sodium. Anything that's processed, a lot of our seasonings have a, a significant amount of salt in them. Now, I want you to be careful about recommending salt substitutes. Salt substitutes have potassium chloride in them. They don't have any sodium chloride in them, but they do have potassium chloride. So if you have a client who needs to manage their potassium at a lower level, maybe they're trying to lower their potassium, you don't want to be recommending salt substitutes. Smoked meats are also high in sodium, pickled foods as well. So really teaching our clients to avoid those high sodium foods. Okay, and then last but not least, there are three specific dietary approaches that control or help to control coronary artery diseases. So we have, the first one is called the therapeutic lifestyle change diet. And this is just an overall cardiovascular health diet. The second one is dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. That one's called the DASH diet. Of course, that one is about lowering hypertension. And then we also have the Mediterranean diet, which again is a diet that is high in those omega-3 fatty acids and healthy fats. Um, and so these are three diets that you do want to be familiar with if you are learning about cardiovascular vascular risk and cardiovascular disease. Now, I'm not going to talk about these in the video today, but I do have a free study guide available to you that goes through each of these different diet plans. All you have to do is send me an email and I will be happy to send you again, this free study guide on each of these diet plans. Okay, guys, um, last video, I did do a couple of practice questions and I got some feedback that you guys really enjoyed that. So let's do three practice questions for something that you might see if you were tested on the content that we just talked about. Okay, so here's the first one. A nurse is teaching a client about dietary recommendations to treat hypertension. Which statement by the client indicates an understanding of the teaching? So I'm going to pause for just a few seconds, but you can always stop the video if you need more time, but I'll give you a few seconds to read through the answer options, and then we are going to talk about the correct answer.
Okay, so the correct answer to this question is I should consume low fat dairy products. So when we think about the incorrect answer options, of course, for daily sodium consumption, we want that this is hypertension, to be less than 2,300 milligrams, but ideally, if we can get to 1,500 milligrams, that's best for hypertension. Remember, if we could control hypertension, then we're less likely to end up with coronary artery disease and a myocardial infarction that could ultimately lead to heart failure. So we really want to get that sodium level down in a client that has hypertension. We want to consume foods that are high in potassium, not low in potassium. That does contribute to lowering blood pressure and cardiovascular health. And then of course we want to stop smoking. We don't want to limit cigarettes. We really want that client to stop smoking to best control hypertension. Okay, next question. A nurse is reviewing a male client's health record that includes a diagnosis of hypertension, a waist circumference of 42 inches, a fasting blood glucose of 132 milligrams per deciliter and a triglycerides level of 200 milligrams per deciliter. And then these findings meet the criteria for which condition. Okay, so of course this one is metabolic syndrome. So when we think about metabolic syndrome, we need three of the five factors to be present in order to be diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. So in this case, the client actually has four, a diagnosis of hypertension, an elevated waist circumference. Remember in males, anything greater than 40 inches is considered central obesity, uh, a fasting blood glucose of 132, anything greater than 100, diagnostic for metabolic syndrome and triglycerides, anything greater than 150. And this client has a 200. Okay, so if we look at our other answer options, hypercholesterol Anemia is too much LDL cholesterol in the blood, not triglycerides. And heart failure is going to be monitored by an elevated BNP. And so your BNP should be less than 100. Anything greater than 100 is an indicator for heart failure. Okay, last question. Eating a high fiber diet helps to lower cholesterol. Which foods should the nurse teach the client that contain high fiber? Okay, answers to this question, beans, whole grains, and broccoli. So cheese and yogurt are going to be high in calcium because those are dairy products. Okay, guys, so that's all I have for you today on nutrition and cardiovascular disease. So again, if you would like a copy of that free study guide that covers the TLC diet, the DASH diet, and the Mediterranean diet, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send that over to you as quickly as possible. Also, be sure that you're subscribed to my channel. That way you don't miss future content that's coming out. And if you're not following me on Twitter or Instagram, I do post over there daily. I post sample NCLEX style questions with answers and rationales, as well as great resources for nursing students, in addition to just some inspirational material. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video.